Hi and welcome to the University of Hertfordshire's um, taster lecture for sport and exercise science. Um, this is just to give you a little insight into the type of lectures that we would do at, within higher education. Um, and then this particular subject area I'm going to focus on, highlight some of the areas of research that you could potentially investigate within sport and exercise science and some of the areas that you could go and work in, in terms of the sports clubs um, that I'll be mentioning. Also, we, as part of this lecture, it highlights the research that we're doing here at Hertfordshire. So kind of three different areas that you can potentially get involved in. Um, so just to give you an in insight. So what we're going to have a look at today, or what we're going to talk about today, is mild traumatic brain injury, so concussion. So this is very popular at the moment across a number of different sports, particularly um, rugby, uh, which is kind of the main focus of what I'm going to talk about today. But you might have seen in the news, um, Scotland in particular, and then in England as well, they're now looking at banning heading for under 12s within football due to the potential unfavourable outcomes of continuously heading and the link with brain injury later on in life. So lots of media attention uh, in regards to this area. So Okay, so the first thing we want to have a look at is how does concussion occur? So here's a little example within rugby. So concussions can occur from direct or indirect blows. And this can be direct blows to the head, like punching, shoulder charge, head butting, things like that. Or it can be indirect blows where you're getting tackles like this one just coming up, tackle from the side, the head flicks back and forwards really, really quickly. So you get this sudden acceleration, deceleration in the brain. And really the brain is basically shaking back and forth. Um, this can also occur in various other sports and particularly the one that's popular at the moment is football. So heading in football, constantly heading the ball and you're not prepared for this or you're heading with the wrong technique and your neck goes back into slight whiplash, you get that acceleration, deceleration of the brain and potentially unfavourable outcomes afterwards. And what happens during this acceleration, deceleration of the brain is what's called the neurobetabolic cascade. And I'll discuss the physiology of that in a few slides time. So why do people research concussion and why is it so popular at the moment? Well, within the sporting context, it leads to suspension of play. So players have to leave the pitch within rugby and they have decreased you know, cognition, coordination, potential memory loss. Um, this, now, this isn't occurring yet in football, but perhaps at some point this may occur. Um, if players are concussed in football, they'd have to come off rather than come back onto the pitch. And then players typically go off and are, are tested for the level of concussion they've got. When you get concussion, you're also increased risk of repeated concussion, as well as increased risk of further injury, such as tendon ligament injuries. So there's obviously um, a higher risk to the players as well. So sports clubs need to be aware of this and manage it properly. But one of the bigger reasons why concussion is so popular at the moment within the media is because the number of unfavourable outcomes that can occur just to health in general, such as so why is concussion classed as a mild traumatic brain injury? So concussion is on the lower end of the Glasgow Coma Scale. The Glasgow Coma Scale level measures the level of consciousness within a person. And so sports concussion is considered the lower scale compared to you know traumatic car crashes and when people end up in comas and things like this. And um, so it's considered mild within regards to the Glasgow Coma Scale, but if it's constantly happening, it's going to lead to some long-term damage. So if you're looking specifically at rugby, 
This is just some data from the English Rugby Premiership, and it's looking across the last seven seasons. These are the top five injuries within um, rugby. So if you look at the 2011-2012, you've got concussion number one, hamstring muscle, hematomas, calf muscle injury, and MCL injury. And then, so they're the top five most common injuries per season. Now the grey squared bars are concussion. So you can see it starts at number one in 2011, and then it just increases constantly at a very, very high and rapid rate, where it peaks in 2016-17, and it's potentially three to four times more concussion injuries than any other injuries within the top five. Um, and this just highlights how higher risk there is within rugby of concussion and how common it, this is um, within rugby. If you look, it then also drops down slightly across one season. And the reason this occurs is because rugby introduced rule changes, such as lowering the height of the tackle and increased sanctions on players, so they got more red or yellow cards, and therefore they weren't willing to tackle as high. And therefore, this did have an effect on the game. So that's really what we want to have a look at today is how can sports science help in terms of influencing concussion and the large risk to the players? So a little bit of physiology, just to give you a little example of some of the areas we might look into across your uh, across exercise physiology within your degree. For concussion to occur, a number of events have to happen. First, you have to have the bio biomechanical trauma. So that's your indirect or direct blow to the head, where you get that acceleration and deceleration. And that has to happen, or for that to happen, for that to be a concussive event, your neuron needs to stretch over 20% of its resting length in under 100 milliseconds. So it has to be a very rapid stretch of the neurons in a very quick period of time. When that occurs, the secondary event is what you can see on your slide here, is the neurometabolic cascade. And what happens here is you get a massive release of neurotransmitters, as you can see here, and you get a, a big kind of uh, exchange of sodium and potassium, and they have to work overtime, which causes hypermetabolism and leads to hyperglycolysis, which eventually leads to a cellular energy crisis and long term you know adaptations to the neurological processes so this isn't you know something that you would want to occur and particularly on a regular occurrence to really see what is going on within these athletes brains when they're concussed you need to investigate the brain and the only way to do this is when the athlete is deceased and to actually have a look in and see what's going on and you see you tend to see these what are called neurofibular tangles it's almost like a spaghettified um, brain there are a number of players that are donating their brains to this cause when they have deceased but it's impossible to do it on live subjects so this is why this is such a challenging area to research okay so how is sports science helping in terms of preventing or aiding concussion related research. So this slide just gives you a little insight into what is currently being done. So at the over here you can see that in boxing, in amateur boxing, they're they've taken away the head cards. This these are now not allowed in competition and the reason for that is when you're wearing gloves and a head guard and you do blows to the head, the head guard absorbs a lot of that kind of pressure, but the brain still shakes, so it's perhaps not as noticeable what's going on. Whereas when you take the head guard off, the head actually goes back and you get a lot more cuts and bruises, but you don't get as much shaking of the brain. So there's thought there that that might potentially reduce it. Over here, you've got increased neck strengthening. So the idea behind that is the stronger your neck is, the less chance you are of getting concussed. Now this may be true at the amateur and recreational levels, but at the elite level, so elite rugby athletes and elite boxers, they do so much neck strengthening 
that it's very hard to imagine that their necks could get that much stronger. So potentially beneficial at the lower levels, but certainly not at the highest. And then over here you have what we've previously discussed about changes to the law. So rugby, they reduced the height of the tackle in the last World Cup. This demonstrated lower levels of concussive incidents because they weren't allowed to tackle above the shoulder or they were getting harsher reprimands such as red or yellow cards. So this, um, this seemed to work pretty well in that World Cup. And over here you've got the biological investigation into concussion. So this is in rugby again where they took saliva samples of players during games when they got concussed to look at the biological um, changes within, at the cellular level to see what was happening after a concussive event and potentially highlight some biomarkers that might be worth investigating. Over here you've got, this is, this is where our students at Hertfordshire were involved, within the club Saracens they looked at this machine here is a little accelerometer attached behind the brain and that just measures the speed of contact so the speed of the head snapping back and so we get an idea of the forces and the speeds involved in some of those tackles in rugby and maybe that will give a more insight into what type of speeds these concussive events are happening and then over here it's very similar you have the accelerometers within the gum shields so it's kind of even more inside the head so when the mouth closed you get these concussive events and it measures the speed of accelerations decelerations within the mouth so lots of um, research going on within this area So what could this all mean? So it's really important to try and prevent examples of concussion. And here's a video of one particular player. We had a number of incidents across kind of a month period. The player's called George North, the Welsh international. He kept getting knocked out and then certain incidents were missed during games. This potentially is going to lead to a number of health issues for this player and obviously the whole point of this is to try and protect player health so it's really important to carry out research to try and do everything we possibly can to prevent these incidents happening in the first place and also to reduce the impact of them afterwards so here at Hertfordshire we're also investigating the the genetic influence of concussion so we're looking at the genetic markers of players to see if there are potentially increased risk due to their genetic makeup compared to other players. Um, so there's lots of different areas of research in regards to concussion. And then other areas within sports science, if you weren't so interested in research, obviously working within sports science, if you're a physiologist or strength and conditioning coach, you'd also be trying to put together training programs to try and improve the strength of the athletes, try and improve their fitness and their energy levels, because that's also been shown to have some evidence of, of potentially reducing the impact of these concussions.